One area of focus that has been discussed for a great period of time in the alternative research community has been the fake Apollo moon landings. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of all that stuff here. Certainly, it's been talked about ad nauseum in films and books and radio shows. Everything from the models that were used to the light sources to, you know, just on and on and on with the voluminous evidence that points in the direction that these were fake, not to mention the fact that, you know, I mean, even these things that were shown as the lunar landers and everything else just appear to be fake. I mean, you've got one of the landers from one of the shots on the moon that they show from the Apollo mission has a satellite dish next to it that's literally an umbrella with, <laughs> you know, a PVC pipe and ribbon and uh, a road cone attached to it. But regardless of all that, it's been talked about ad nauseum and argued and attempted to be debunked and everything else. One of the areas of focus in my research is always going back and watching films and science fiction movies and seeing what they've put in these things. And you can gain a lot of insight, especially when you go back and watch some of the, the science fiction movies and films and TV shows and different things. Also books as well that you may, maybe you read as a kid or watch as a kid or or an adult, and now that you you know know a bit about the world and how it really works, and the real truth uh, about how the world is, you tend to see these things with a new pair of eyes when you're watching them. It's almost as if watching them for the first time because you have a new frame of reference. Things start to make sense to you in a way that you've never seen before. And one of the areas that I've been focusing on quite a bit lately has been the Star Trek films. Of course, the creator of the Star Trek series Gene Roddenberry was a 33rd-degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. Many Masonic references, Kabbalistic references in the, uh, in the Star Trek pantheon. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into all of them here. Everything from uh, the fact that you had all of the uh, Vulcans being portrayed by Jewish actors, and they all had their own form of mysticism that very much related to Kabbalism. In fact, in... Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, you see a ritual being performed where Spock's father is wearing what appears to be an ephod chest plate, which you see used in Kabbalistic ceremonies and in the like. And uh, also, as well, the, the Vulcan hand sign that he uses, which, of course, is a Kabbalistic hand sign, but that's neither here nor there. So as I was doing some research the other night, I was going through, and I just had gotten uh, the copy of the first six original Star Trek films, that, of course, had the original Enterprise crew from the Star Trek motion picture all the way to the last, the sixth film, which came out in the early 1990s. And included in this set is a disc entitled The, the Captain's Summit, a interview that was conducted back last year, 2009, for the release, the Paramount Pictures release of the six original Star Trek films on DVD. And this was hosted by uh, Whoopi Goldberg, and it featured Jonathan Frakes, Patrick Stewart, William Shatner, and Leonard Nimoy. Now, in this, they're reminiscing and telling stories about being on the set of Star Trek and various things that they experienced and did and their, their memories of the show. And during this interview, William Shatner lets out a very, very interesting piece of information, which we'll get to in just a minute. We'll also show the clip. Now, going back to what I mentioned earlier, of course, Gene Roddenberry, the creator of the Star Trek series, was a 33rd-degree Freemason, and he brought on board for the original Star Trek series one of Warner Von Braun, Dr. Warner Von Braun, a lot of you may be familiar with him. He was the ex-head of the Nazi space program brought over to the United States of America after World War II to head up NASA. Because at that time, we couldn't get a rocket off the ground here, and our space program was a complete failure. All of a sudden, overnight, after the Project Paperclip program, when we bring all these Nazis over here after World War II and start putting them in charge of our of our space program, all of a sudden we have this brilliant and amazing space program almost immediately overnight. And so the gentleman, again, that was headed up the science advisory team for the Star Trek series was one of these paperclip Nazis brought over here after World War II. Now, interestingly enough, there's been quite a bit of, uh, of referencing to various things that have now occurred in, in different technologies. There's a, a very interesting book out there uh, that you can find online that's entitled Hitler's Suppressed and Still Secret Weapons, Science and Technology, and it talks about in this book how they had things as, such as the rail gun, and Hitler had things such as the uh, as the phasers and all this, this technology that ended up making its way into shows like Star Trek. And also another interesting correlation was how you had, uh, you had Spock, the Vulcan, being from the star system. His planet was located in the star system Epsilon Iridani. Very recently, in the past year, 
There's been references in science magazines and the Astrophysicist Journal that the star system Epsilon Eridani may possibly harbor alien life. And that if we were contacted by alien life, this is where it would come from. And I, I thought that was immediately interesting. And uh, especially in light of the possibility of the false flag alien invasion scenario, which, of course, Dr. Werner von Braun, the ex-head of the Nazi space program, had talked about to his secretary, Carol Rosen, in the 1970s as he was dying of cancer. And the famous quote, of course, goes, that first the threat would be communism, and then the threat would be terrorism from the Middle East, and then it would be asteroids, and then it would be the threat of extraterrestrials, and all of it would be a lie as a pretext for the installation of space-based weapons. So immediately when I started hearing about, wow, isn't that interesting that, you know, there in the Star Trek series, Epsilon Eridani was where Vulcan, the planet of, of course, the, uh, the Vulcan such as Spock and others, who are, again, all portrayed by Jewish actors, there was actually also, interestingly enough, there was a strange episode of Star Trek entitled Patterns of Force, and this was in the original series, and this depicted them going to a planet where there's Nazis, and you end up seeing uh, <laughs> Captain Kirk and Spock and Bones McCoy parading around in, in, uh, in Nazi uniforms. It was just, <laughs> it's just completely ridiculous, considering that, of course, Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner are both Jewish. And uh, so I thought it was just it was just amazing, strange correlation there, considering you had this, you know, former Nazi being the head of the uh, of the advisory team for the for the science that was featured in the Star Trek films. And again, Gene Roddenberry being a 33rd degree Freemason, it wraps it all up there in a very nice, interesting way. And one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned, in this new Captain Summit featuring some of these original characters in it that was filmed and, and came out in uh, October of last year of 2009. They talk about various things that they were able to do uh, from the fact that they made science interesting to people. And uh, William Shatner makes a very, very interesting statement. And we're going to see this clip. He alludes to the fact that, uh, that, that they had brought him into NASA just prior to the uh, launch of the Apollo mission to the moon and actually allowed him to sit down inside of the capsule. And as they sat him down inside of the capsule, in front of the plate glass window, they had a screen that he said from, in his own words, which you'll see here in just a moment, they were projecting an image of space, and that they actually flew a model of the Enterprise across this screen while he was sitting in the capsule, and that when he came out, there was 5,000 engineers that were all at the bottom of the stairs after he came out of the capsule all applauding. And, it, and, and it's just bizarre, and I got the impression, well, first off, you know, if you talk about models being used in, in, to produce the Apollo moon mission, you're a conspiracy theorist. And number two, it really just sounded like they were almost using William Shatner as a guinea pig, someone who was an actor, to see how realistic it would seem to him, because in this clip, he really seems as if, if, it's, you know, if it was kind of realistic to him. So I found this very strange and interesting, and, and I'd like to see what you, the audience out there, think, and you can leave comments on this uh, video, whether you agree with it or disagree or think that I'm way off the mark or whether I, uh, I'm right on with what I believe. But I think that personally, in my opinion, this is one of the best cases we've seen yet of the cat being let out of the bag in terms of, uh, of, of these models and this fakery going on on our trip to the moon. Even more recently in the modern day, there was a proposed mission to get back to the moon by the year 2020 in which uh, Obama, President Obama has now canceled it. They said we can't even get to the moon after 2020 because we don't have the technology, yet we have the technology to get there in 1969. So, again, I'm not here to try to preach you on whether or not I believe the moon landings are real or fake. I think it's pretty easy to tell what they are. I, you don't need me to tell you what that is. Anybody that can think for themselves and has two eyes can be smart enough to look at these various pieces of information and understand that if they couldn't make it to the moon, they were going to fake it to the moon, as the expression goes. And I believe that's what wholeheartedly what they did. But this clip, to me, and I was just, you know, wasn't doing research on the subject of the moon landings. I was doing research and on Star Trek and the different pieces of programming and things that and the indicators that I think we're going to see for things that they're going to use in the future. Came across this clip and was just completely floored. And uh, I think that you will be too, so here it is. You know, uh, but if you treat the question seriously, I mean, uh, uh, not sort of inappropriate mm. uh, behavior, but uh, however you define that, but uh, what we know to be true, uh, like NASA, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, days when we were doing the show, uh, NASA would be sending up rockets uh, trying to get to the moon. Right. 
and uh, our ratings would go up when the rocket went up. And as our ratings went up, uh, more money was appropriated to NASA because of the popularity of our show. And so from time to time, one of us would be invited to a rocket uh, uh, launch. Mm -hmm. and, and it was uh, extraordinary. And I was invited to, uh, 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 to, to see the, the LEM, the lunar module, and in fact got into the lunar module uh, with all those uh, uh, people. There, as when I came out, of, well, I was in the lunar module. Right. I, I've told this story before, but it's, I suppose, not inappropriate here. And I was lying down in the hammock where ultimately one of the astronauts uh, maneuvered the, the craft to the moon. And I'm looking there, and out, oh, right over here, right, like right here, is a lead window, a lead, leaded mm -hmm. glass window, so that you could see out. For some reason, they wanted the astronauts to be able to do, use a sextant or something to shoot the stars. And, and as I'm looking out at a star field that they, had, they were projecting from right. some place in the building, the Enterprise shot across. Oh. And when I came down, I, oh. I never told you this story. No. And when I came down the stairs, because there was gigantic stairs, it was like coming out of the, the, some church and, we were, uh, and walked down these stairs, there were 5,000 engineers that all collected. They were all in on the joke because earlier in the day when it was announced that I was coming, they went down to some place and they bought a model and all these engineers were putting the model together and then they, they photographed it to shoot across. So they all laughed and, and I came down and signed on the model that they finally met, see you on the moon because it was just shortly before they, they went to the moon. And that was part of the Star Trek popularity that fitted in with... Uh